Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo, and today I bring you a terrifying tale of a pizza delivery driver who went out to deliver a half pepperoni, half mushroom pizza, but never returned to her place of employment. What happened to Ashley Biggs that frightful June night in 2012? Was this the work of a stranger or was this the work of a calculated killer who specifically targeted Ashley? Join me today as I discuss the crazy tangled web that is the murder of Ashley Biggs. Now, let's dig in. My sources for today's case include the Law and Crime Network's YouTube live video coverage of the trial in the case of Ohio versus Stefanko, court TV coverage of the same trial, and articles by the Daily Beast, Daily Mail, and Canton Rep. Chad Cobb was born on January 28, 1982 to Jay and Cindy Cobb. Initially raised in Enid, Oklahoma for close to a decade when his family relocated to Easton, Ohio. Chad lived in a farmhouse in the country and he was an only child. Chad went to Doylestown High School where he graduated and went off to join the military. But sadly, the military didn't work out for him and for unknown reasons, after only six months, he returned home no longer a military member. Chad dabbled in labor work and worked as a mechanic for a few years until getting into telecommunications sometime in 2004. He was 22 years old at the time. A year before landing that telecom gig, though, he went roller skating and he met a girl named Ashley Biggs. He liked her and upon meeting at the rink, they became friends and ultimately that friendship turned into something more. After they became a thing, he got into telecom, as I just mentioned. And then on July 18th, 2005, Chad and Ashley welcomed a beautiful little girl who I will call GC. During this time, Chad had built up his own company where he was doing telecom maintenance and aerial construction. In any given moment, his business was just him or it could be up to 13 people. And he described that he was doing very well for himself. Chad and Ashley played at house for a few months after the baby was born, but ultimately, for reasons that have not been made clear to me through my research, but according to Chad, Ashley up and abandoned him and their daughter, only returning to see them when it was convenient to her. During this period, Ashley joined the army, and according to Chad, she didn't even bother with their baby girl, GC. But although Chad made it seem like Ashley just up and left, it would later be revealed that Chad had pled guilty in 2005 to domestic violence. So you can deduce that Ashley probably left in an effort to leave her abusive boyfriend. And maybe since he was never abusive towards the baby girl, maybe Ashley felt comfortable leaving. And this is all just me guessing. After Ashley escaped or left, depending on whose story you believe, Chad decided it was time to start playing the field again. And in December of 2006, while browsing the then popular MySpace social media website, he met another woman. Her name was Erica Lyon. Their courtship was quick and within a few months, she moved in with Chad. By this point, Chad's business was a cable company and he did some subcontracting work for Warner. So it was a pretty big deal. And in seeing that Chad was doing so well for himself, in 2007, the court awarded Chad primary custody of GC. And I'm sure that in that moment, this arrangement made complete sense considering that Chad was raising GC on his own. Chad was happy to have custody of GC. He was a doting father and GC loved her daddy. Fast forward a few years and on November 19th, 2009, Chad and Erica welcomed their first daughter together. And while wanting to actually be a family, Chad and Erica tied the knot sometime in 2010. The entire time that Erica was in the picture, she filled in as GC's mom, since, you know, Ashley was not around. It is alleged that from September 2009 through October 5th of 2011, 
Ashley had absolutely no contact with GC. Zero, zilch, nada. That's a full two years. But then after alleged radio silence, on October 5th, 2011, a parent's worst nightmare came true. GC was only six years old at the time. She must have been in the first grade. Well, Chad went to pick GC up at school, and when he got there, the school had some very bad news. GC was gone. She had been picked up by her mother, Ashley Biggs, who showed the school a court order saying she now had temporary custody of the kid. Chad was pissed. But not only was he pissed, he was confused. How could Ashley come in and take a child she hadn't seen in two years with a court order? There clearly had to be some misunderstanding. And this began a nine-month bitter, bitter child custody battle that would ultimately lead to murder. Chad was adamant that he wanted his daughter back, so he hired an attorney to help make that a reality. But it would be close to three to four months before Chad, GC's primary caregiver her entire life, was able to see GC again. After months and months of the court considering the custody case, they finally allowed Chad to visit GC. Chad claims that he tried to make the situation as cordial as possible between him and Ashley, claiming that the first time that he saw Ashley in court after she took GC, he even asked her to lunch at a place called Luigi's Pizza, but she refused. Also, during one of the custody court hearings, Chad became aware that Ashley now had a girlfriend by the name of Brittany Dunson. It was during these court hearings that Chad would become aware of some allegations that GC was making against his very own wife, Erica Lyon, allegations that he had never heard before. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day, so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. 
At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you. And it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. Ashley Biggs joined the Army, as I mentioned earlier, and she did her time finally separating from the Army sometime in 2009, I believe. From what I can tell, she didn't have any issues in the military. On July 7th, 2009, Ashley and Brittany Dunson met at Brittany's aunt's house and their relationship progressed pretty quickly. In fact, Brittany recalls that they moved in together within a month or two and they were as smitten as smitten could be. The little background that I could find on Ashley, I got through watching Brittany's courtroom testimony. Ashley had confided in her previously that Chad had been abusive during their relationship and controlling towards her. And to be frank, Ashley was afraid of Chad, which may explain why she didn't visit GC often. When Ashley and Brittany met, Ashley wasn't quite sure where Chad was living. In fact, she didn't know anything about GC until one day she got a message from the Children's Services Board, the CSB. The CSB wanted Ashley, as GC's biological mother, to know about the opened and sometimes closed cases regarding GC. And for those of you wondering, the goal of the Ohio CSB is to protect abused, neglected, and dependent children and to strengthen families. So getting a letter from the CSB This clearly intrigued Ashley, but the letters were so vague that she didn't quite understand what exactly was going on. So she rightfully wanted to dig a little deeper. What the flip was happening to her child? One day in October of 2011, Ashley went to the court to get more information about these opened and closed CSB cases involving her daughter. While she was there, according to Brittany, One thing led to the next, and when Ashley walked out of the court, she had a temporary custody order for GC. Ashley, not one to shy away from confrontation, was like, great, but how does this work? Will a police officer go with me to pick up the kid? I mean, I need some backup. And since she asked nicely, an officer did go with her to the school on October 5th, 2011 to escort her. Because it was during the school day and Chad had not been put on notice, retrieving GC went without incident. Ashley took GC to go see her grandparents and eventually made her way to Brittany's mom's house. After Chad was made aware that his child was with Ashley, he lost his marbles. I mean, rightfully so. This is a smallish community, so it's not surprising that everyone knows everyone. But after hearing the news, that GC was now with Ashley, Chad's mom and grandma, they go to confront Ashley. Now, Chad's mom, her name is Cindy, and his grandma end up showing up at Brittany's mom's house. (laughs) Now, mind you, Chad doesn't know Brittany from Adam, except when he saw her those few times at the child custody hearings. But apparently, his mama knows where Brittany's mama lives, and then she goes to confront them. Chad's family was trying to knock some sense into Ashley, pleading with her to let them retrieve GC because GC had not seen or heard from Ashley in close to two years. They believed it might be traumatic to allow her to be separated from the only family she had known in a few years. But they left without GC because Ashley knew she had a court order, so no one was going to make her feel bad about having her daughter back. And the months that followed were a wild, file anything at least a few times a week kind of battle of the exes. Because of the level of scrutiny and complaints filed against each family, Ashley and Brittany even had to have occasional one-on-ones with Child Protective Services to assess the family living situation. On a different occasion, Chad wanted to take GC on a family Disney trip, but Ashley fought the request. 
The day of June 20th, 2012 was a typical day. Ashley had to work at Domino's that night, but during the day, she hung out with her girlfriend, Brittany. Brittany describes the day as completely normal. They went shopping, they bought a coffee table, they looked at rings, and they even went to lunch. Brittany and Ashley had talked about marriage for a hot minute by this point, so they were both ecstatic to be making that dream a reality. Then later that afternoon, Ashley got ready and left for work at the Domino's located in Green, Ohio. At about 11.42 p.m., a call came into the Domino's. The female customer ordered a large pizza pie, half mushroom, half pepperoni. Ugh, yuck. The order was prepared and off Ashley went to make her delivery. The delivery location was only a few blocks from the Domino's, so it should have been a quick trip. But after an hour, Ashley's manager and Dunson family friend, Matt Travis, began to get antsy because Ashley hadn't returned from her delivery. Travis didn't want to get too crazy, you know, he wasn't sure what could have happened, but he thought it important to call Brittany to find out if she had heard anything from Ashley. Brittany told him no, and Matt explained the mysterious circumstances surrounding Ashley not coming back. Some weirdo ordered a mushroom and pepperoni pizza, and Ashley never returned. The call ended and Brittany was sufficiently freaked out because she knew Ashley had enemies. Brittany woke her mom up and drove to the Domino's, but when she got there, Matt had already filed a missing persons report. So Brittany was met by police officers. Brittany immediately jumped into crime junkie mode, telling cops about the contemptuous child custody battle between Chad Cobb and Ashley. Also noting to police that Chad's grandmother, she lived only a mile or two from the Domino's. But while police were taking a statement from Brittany, another group of officers were dispatched to the last known location of Ashley's delivery, 647 West Turkey Foot Lake Road. When police arrive, it's an abandoned one-story business. So at first glance, nothing looks out of place until they drive around back and they discover a terrifying scene. There in the parking lot is a large amount of blood on the concrete. And it's not a little, it's actually a lot. It appears that there was an attack and then there appears to be drag marks. So now this missing persons case has really amped up because now you know someone is hurt or dead and time is of the essence. Police at the Turkey Lake location head back to the Domino's and they are looped in about this child custody battle and the fact that Chad's grandmother lives a stone's throw from the Domino's. So cops get the address and they roll out. They are heading to 731 Rex Lake Road. And what they find when they roll out sends chills down the most seasoned police officers' spines. Police roll up to the house and at first blush, remember it's close to 4.30 a.m. by this point, everything appears quiet. They roll around back and what they find is odd to say the least. They see a Lincoln Navigator and inside is Erica Lyons and four children all in the back seat, ranging from two months old to six years old. And when the cops look into the tree line behind the house, they see a set of eyes. It's the eyes of Chad Cobb just standing there. They go in for the arrest and Chad is arrested without incident, as is Erica Lyons. When they search the car, they find cleaning supplies. As the pair is taken into custody, police continue to search for Ashley, knowing full well something terrible may have happened to her. And they continue the search. The search somehow leads them to a remote cornfield in Chippewa Township. And there, in the very back corner of the cornfield, they find Ashley's car. The corn stalks weren't very high because it was the beginning of summer. So cops spotted the abandoned car far in the field. And when they got closer and look inside, they saw Ashley Biggs. She was wearing her Domino's pizza shirt, khaki shorts, white sneakers, and she is as purple as purple can be. It is evident she is deceased. When police open the back seat to examine Ashley, they find she has zip ties on a few locations. But most shockingly, she has a zip tie around her neck. 
When I first heard about that fact, I was a bit shocked imagining those small household zip ties. But Ashley didn't have a small zip tie around her neck. No, 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 no. She had a four foot zip tie tied around her neck. Something only a professional would need to even carry around. But more on this in a bit. But also attached to her body are two taser wires hanging from her. Immediately, the police realized whoever caused Ashley's murder used a stun gun, a.k.a. a taser gun, to subdue Ashley. Now, break, break. You know that we are always hearing about taser guns. Did you know that the word taser is actually a brand and not the actual name of the gun or the type of gun? Now, I was shocked upon learning this and I felt so embarrassed because we're always calling the guns that police officers carry tasers. But the stun gun is actually called a conducive energy weapon. At least that's what one of the investigators in this case called it. But anyhow, I digress. By the way, also while researching this case, I wondered who in the world would need a four foot zip tie. And of course, I found the answer in the fact that these large or larger than normal zip ties are used in electronic businesses to keep those wires under wraps. An example would be a phone company or a cable company. Well, of course, as soon as the police find Ashley, they quickly work to obtain a search warrant to search the Cobb family home, the one he shared with Erica and their four kids. And when police rolled up to that house, they immediately see items that appear suspect. First, they secure the perimeter. And in the backyard, there in plain sight is a large fire pit. There's also a chicken coop towards the back of the yard and the coop is under construction and right in front of the coop is a makeshift workbench table. On this workbench table, if that is even what it's really called, they find items that appear to clearly connect those who live at that house with the murder of Ashley Biggs. On the work table, they find some men's boots and men's camel pants, both all muddy. They also find a stun gun and they find four foot zip ties. Sound familiar? They find a backpack and inside the backpack, they find a roll of duct tape, a piece or two of duct tape that's not attached to the actual roll, a phaser cartridge, and this is what goes in the stun gun. They find camouflage face paint, black neoprene gloves, and a face mask. They also find a Cobb cable t-shirt with blood stains on it. With all of the damning evidence in hand, police end up charging Chad Cobb with capital aggravated murder, kidnapping, aggravated robbery, felonious assault, retaliation, tampering with evidence, grand theft, abuse of a corpse, possessing criminal tools, and domestic violence. He now faces the death penalty. Without any additional evidence, the police release Erica Lyons and she returns back to the Cobb home to raise the kids. Erica frequently visits Chad in jail and she brought the kids in during visiting hours to visit with him as well. Investigators, though, were not convinced that Erica wasn't somehow involved in the planning and execution of Ashley's murder. But Chad wasn't talking and without any physical evidence tying Erica to Ashley's murder, there was nothing the investigators could do. But they just kept wondering, who was the female that made that call to Domino's that night? And the fact that she was in that car behind Chad's grandparents' house only hours after Ashley was killed, after going on a delivery run, this kept nagging at the investigators' minds. And who keeps four kids under the age of seven out of their house until 0430 in the morning anyway. And it wasn't like they were actually somewhere. They were sitting in a car. In fact, even more suspect to the police officers was how shady Erica was. Now, they had a court order to get DNA evidence from Erica. And when they went to get a DNA sample strictly for the purpose of reference, because her and Chad had shared vehicles, Erica refused to give her DNA. And because there was an actual court order, Erica was held in contempt. Now, with the mounting evidence against Chad, months after Ashley's murder, he decided to take a plea deal in an effort to remove the death penalty from the table. 
His trial and sentence ended up taking place in February of 2013, eight months after Ashley's murder. While Chad was in jail awaiting his trial, he had heard grumblings that his wife was messing around with one of his longtime pals, a guy named Mike Stefanko. Now, Mike and Chad had been neighbors when they were younger. They went to grade school together. And when Chad started his own successful business, Mike ended up working for Chad. So Chad was in jail. There was so much that he needed to do. He just didn't think about this rumor, grumbling, whatever he had, you know, the death penalty to consider. Well, he didn't think about it much until the date of his trial and sentencing hearing in February of 2013, when in walked Erica, pregnant as pregnant could be. Chad thought to himself, is this my kid? If so, why hadn't Erica told him about it? But he knew full well, Erica was not carrying his child. Mind you, she had just had a baby two months before Ashley Biggs was murdered. And this is when Chad finally realized his wife had been playing him while he was in jail. But we'll get to that story later. For his offenses, Chad was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Before the investigators closed the case, however, they made one last ditch effort to see if Erica was somehow involved in the case. Detective Mike Hitchings paid Chad a visit at the Lake Erie Correctional Institution, but Chad refused to talk. So that was really it for the murder of Ashley Biggs. That is, until 2017, four years later, when Detective Hitchings received a letter from none other than Chad Cobb. But you'll have to wait until next time to hear about what happens next and how this seemingly closed case was cracked wide open after the alleged sole murderer pled guilty. Don't forget to tune in next week where you get to hear the real story of what happened to Ashley Biggs and how it took eight years for the people responsible to finally be held accountable. Or if you want to get part two right now, join the fan club at any level where you will get access to part two immediately. And remember, in the month of December, if you sign up at any level, you get a vinyl podcast sticker. So what are you waiting for? All right. Follow me on social media, on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast and on Facebook at Military True Crime. Shout out to my new Dotted Line supporters, Nikia M, Kendall B, Brittany R and Dakota F. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all for supporting the show. You'll never know how much it truly means to me. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with all of the Boot Camp and Higher Fan Club members. And the music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. Let's work another podcast.